So a very beautiful morning to everyone. Um, I am very excited to be over here, of course. Um, and it gives me an immense pleasure to be a part of this extraordinary fest uh, and be among the most distinguished guests we have. Uh, Shri Padma Shri uh, Padma Bhushan, uh, uh, Mr. Dr. Shri Dharan, sir. Along with, I'm thankful to the Confess team itself. It has been an enormous effort to put the things together. Uh, let me begin my presentation today. I am going to present on urban design. Urban design, you know, of course, um, it's clearly, you know, the duration <laughs> given to me of half an hour for this particular topic is not enough because it's a very vast topic. Uh, but I will try with all my humility, I'll try to encapsulate and make it more crisp for you. Uh, my whole intention over here to come on this podium and inspire the generation to come. Um, let's begin with something by asking to the audience over here what they understand as an urban design. If uh, anybody would like to speak about it, they are most welcome. But I would like to hear from the team if they understand what actual urban design is. So urban design is the art of relating structures to one another and their natural settings to serve the contemporary living. This was one definition which was defined in year 1955 by one of the most famous urban designer, Clarence Stein. Um, it is an art of creating uh, and shaping cities, clearly. And it is about connecting or connections between people and places, movement and urban form, nature and uh, built fabric. So it's, it's a very simple definition of what an urban design is all about. And it is also a framework that orders the elements into the network of streets, creates squares and urban blocks. Urban design which blends architecture, landscape and the city planning together uh, to make an urban areas optimally functional and more attractive. Well, I can, I can summarize the definition of urban design in one single slide and uh, primarily, you know, the urban design actually talks about the tools and the principles. So what are the tools of urban design? The basic tools of urban design talks about buildings, public spaces, streets, transport, landscape. And with these tools, the urban designer, what he does, he tries to follow a certain urban design principles. Which are those urban design principles? The urban design principles is to ensure that any particular city has to be a walkable city, very well connected. It has to have a mixed use density. It has to be, have a mixed housing schemes, making it a very rejuvenated quality of life, sustainable, green transports, and many others. You know, so quality of life is the whole intention to ensure that how the overall urbanism is brought together with the tools, as I mentioned over here, in the public spaces and the transport areas. But in order to go deeper, it is imperative for us to actually understand the inception of why and how the urban design with all its tools and principles should be determined or should be used to make the future cities for us. Before I get into the depths in terms of why it is required, it is important for us to understand that where we are heading towards with all our policy guidelines in the prevailing urban form and the prevailing uh, structure, what we are using it to design our cities. Well, let me begin by speaking about innovations in urban design. Okay, so I, I will try my best to kind of give a definition to the innovations. Normally, whenever I travel, I, 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 have, a, I have a habit of sketching. So, you know, this is one sketch which is very close to my heart and it kind of describes everything for me when I look at a city. For me, a city is more like a hub and spoke sort of a configuration. There are various hubs in the city. Uh, the hub could be an institution, the hub could be a commercial development, a hub could be a government body or an administrative block, or maybe a railway station or an airport. And then it is very well connected with the infrastructure of road connectivity, utilities, etc. And they are all intertwining between each other, creating a lot of dynamics in the city. So this was one, one sketch I just thought, I'll, I'll, I'll put it on the slide which I kind of look at any city where I travel. 
Well, let's begin by speaking about how the overall city grows and let us step back a little and take a wider perspective to it. The word city dis indisputably actually defines the center of gravity. You know, it kind of attracts and grows. So they are like magnetic fields, as I mentioned. The area over which they exert the, their pull can vary according to the composition, qualitative differences of its components, attitudes, power functions within the national context, property value, etc. The various elements coming together create the cities and make the cities grow by itself. The push and pull factors, of course, could be the search of employment, the search of a new life for the people to come in and gather in and make the cities grow and grow and grow. This kind of creates an edgelessness to the city many a times. And there is a huge proliferation of the city going on as we are talking right now. I don't want to get into the dynamics of migration and what number of people kind of uh, come to the cities every minute in the world. But let's begin by talking about what creates a mega city itself. So if I have to show certain images, these images are very popular. Everybody knows about how populous the city of Tokyo is. And similarly, the, the Manhattan, specifically the lower Manhattan areas, they obviously have a huge density which has attracted numerous people from various parts of the world in search of job, in search of searching for a quality life. Well, if I have to kind of define this a little more, I can define it in a way that how the mega cities across the world have grown. And I'll ask Jaden to just run a short video over it. But primarily, for the first time in human history, more than half of the world's population are living in cities. <clears throat> and generally, you know, the, the, it kind of raises a certain arrested questions, which we are actually can ask ourselves. How does the increasing concentration of people and human endeavor in the cities change our world? Well, today, if I have to answer it in one line, it is changing everything for us. They are transforming ecology, economics, politics, social relations, everything and everywhere. Better or for worse, whatever you call it. <clears throat> for the first time in human history, as I mentioned, the urban population is increasing at a rate of a quarter of a million people per day. It is like saying that it is almost equivalent to a new London every month. And now that nearly around 3.5 billion people have organized their lives in the cities, we would be joined by another 2 billion people, more than that rather, for the next 25 years. And the nature of what we call the city itself has changed. And the result is something bigger than that. It is primarily creating a planet of cities, which is a single, cohesive, comprehensive, and a complex, connected, but a very unstable urban system. <clears throat> well, such a dynamism of the city can primarily evolve two kinds of formations in a city, if I were to say. One is what we call it as an urban sprawl. The other one is probably the urban intensification. So I've got just two slides, one from the very famous city of US. The other one is the Tokyo region itself. The sprawl, if I were to explain a little briefly, is primarily the spread of a condition where the urban centers kind of grow at a rapid pace. And the result is what you see as an image on the top. It has got vast landscapes of these low density housing, low density development. And this, primarily the reason of this development is because of the high speculation of land costs, high rate values at the downtown areas itself. So what the government decided is, the land is available to you, keep spreading across. And that's what the urban sprawl turns out to be. Well, of course, one of the major shortcomings of this particular development is the nature of growth itself. What it does, it kind of leads to a growing dependencies on cars, long commutes, increasing the greenhouse gas emissions 
at an unacceptable level, of course. And then it also increases the infrastructure load, which results into a wastage of uh, resources, a very inefficient supplies, etc. So clearly, it is not the way forward for any particular city to grow. On the other hand, of course, there is an urban intensification, but I'll come to that in a short while. Well, when the, when the environmentalists and the urban planner looked at urban sprawl, they clearly kind of looked on the urban intensification of it. So there's, you know, the, the whole idea of gathering the density and making it at, to grow at one particular area was the intention of most of the planners together. And which obviously resulted in one of the most famous urban form, what we call it as a tall building today. The tall buildings obviously grew at a very, very rapid pace. And they grew obviously because of the, the concern which was drawn from the above uh, reasoning. But what happened in terms of the growing concerns? Well, the tall buildings were then stretched to all its uh, limits. This is one more slide which kind of supports the previous argument in terms of the graph which kind of defines how the uh, you know, the resources were kind of uh, determined and the sustainability is clearly compromised. Especially when you see the yellow dots on the top, it talks about, uh, you know, how the transport related energy cons consumptions per year increases as the sprawl increases versus the cities like Hong Kong, Singapore, etc. Which further, of course, fo fosters the definition of why we should go tall in most of the cities. Similarly, you know, the southern graph. So these are purely technical details which the planners used to kind of endorse themselves towards the development, towards a high density development. And then, of course, as I mentioned, it kind of grew birth to a tall building and an unprecedented level. Now, what do we look at it in terms of a high intensity development? Well, Clearly from the image what you can see, there was an absolute sporadic development in an unprecedented way for this kind of uh, matchbox sort of buildings coming up, condensing the whole thing together, you know, getting uh, the urban uh, landform to be used at its optimum level. Clearly, the social considerations were compromised to a large extent which led to the derelict, congested and unhealthy living environment, of course, as you can notice over here. The streets were now, of course, uh, being dominated by glass boxes, uh, which are very repulsive, generating vacuum in the city itself. At an end user, if you are walking along the streets of this particular fabric, uh, which is one example which is, I brought in from Sao Paulo, you know, it obviously kind of shows that it is a very, very unhealthy environment, especially when you are walking across the streets or even the pockets of green, what you might notice over here. Well, it is obviously said that a poorly managed and a badly planned city or a density, I would say, <clears throat> can lead to a very, very unhealthy environment, lack of daylight, etc. This obviously has been extensively researched many times by the urban scientists. So, obviously, you know, we need to question ourselves in terms of what we are looking at. This is one very famous image from Chicago, which talks about what happened in terms of the increased density. You know, you are absolutely in a derelict place uh, where there is absolute zero light coming in, no livable conditions, and the city itself was converted into more like a machine where you are living. Okay, let me step back a little more and kind of create this particular statement over here for the audience to understand. If urban sprawl is clearly sustainable, but urban intensification is questionably sustainable and riddled with issues and complexities, what methods should be used in the search for a sustainable urban design? This was Charles Jenks in 1996. So it kind of brings down to a question, how do you design a city where the urban resources and the urban quality of life both are not compromised? Well, the, the answer lies somewhere with us. One of the beauties of the high density cities such as New York, for example, I would say it is a, to a lot of extent, it is practicing this uh, phenomena of a walkable city, what I call it, where there are these large scale, of course, the Central Park, huge 
garden spaces which kind of creates a relief in the city it has a thriving neighborhood of course it kind of brings a lot of strong sense of community it mixes living and working to a lot of extent of course it is debatable one can actually get it into the granular level and kind of talk about the mid china towns and the, the quality of life over there in terms of the infrastructure though nevertheless it does when i speak about certain words which i did i think it does sound a little more attractive in terms of how do you design these cities so why are the cities not uh, defined or designed in a certain way where we can kind of bring around a certain kind of a balance between how to and what percentage of open spaces how the density can be mitigated and how, what we can basically and how we can deal with it so you know it is there is a very famous quote which talks about if you wish to look far into the future you need to do your homework right you know you need to look back into the past deeper into the past some of the beautiful medieval cities european cities in fact a lot of indian cities also have also set many examples how the the nature the resources how the city planning is done and you can kind of live your life along the streets in a most most beautiful way and there are many things one can learn out of it sustainability requires us to think holistically and this is as true of the city's infrastructure the urban glue that holds us together as of its own architecture so urban design is not only limited to the infrastructure or road planning or gardens and landscape and all and like that it actually starts at a unit level so you want us to start looking at as an individual in terms of how he kind of envisages his own spaces around him some of the popular asian cities of course you know once the infrastructure has a appropriate definition and a good quality of life one can obviously go down and look into the examples of uh you know uh, some of the very ancient indian cities maybe varanasi or uh, you know certain old cities of india itself where you have a lot of colors a lot of vibrancies in the cities and you act actually start enjoying the city much more the as an individual level one can basically then extend beyond the doorstep start taking the streets uh, into his account of using them more the accountability to the city infrastructure the more the belonging the sense of belonging it is so let me let me move forward i think uh, a great part of the success of neighborhoods depends on their overlapping and interviewing you know there is a very beautiful word which i always keep using in my uh, speeches is simultaneity there is a word called simultaneity everybody knows the dictionary meaning of simultaneity but the idea of simultaneity in urban design is very important what it does is that in a given particular space of land in the city that particular space is designed in such a way and such a context that it can be used at one moment of time in the day for an urban uh, business district centers it can also kind of accommodate the cultural events or the social events of the cities so the same space how optimally can it be used can be defined very well in the cities and how these spaces once they are created in various parts of the cities can then be overlapped interviewing and the same can be translated into a various street neighborhoods well i already spoke about how the the density can kind of play a, play a very vital role in terms of increasing the value of the city so this were some of the graphs which i had put together um you know as a you know as a land value increases with the increased development of capacity is what has been kind of described in this particular graph the construction cost per unit decreases while you basically go with the increased density this this particular graph or the or this particular slide is primarily to define but it is also important as i mentioned to have a compact configuration when we have a definition of having live work and leisure if i were to kind of define our overall lifestyle these are the three parameters which we do normally in a daily routine and if we try to bring them together it is very very important that how once the high density is created how we can actually create a little more livable place <clears throat> so the urban density and a mixed use are the key factors in determining the sustainability of the precinct of the neighborhood as we know it and it kind of creates a lot of urban livability spaces mixed use neighborhoods are also more likely to offer the employment locally as i mentioned if i have to define this compact city on the other hand it's a mixed use of the special urban forms characterized by the compactness which defines a relatively a dense area linked 
by an easy access of public transport. Conventionally, the emerging network business districts, if I had to mention, where you have a central business district, and then you have got these kind of development. That's the most traditional way, and most of the American cities are kind of designed on that format. But the networked urban district is what we are looking at right now. So that is what we are looking at in terms of the urban solution and what we will be reaching to in forms of complexity definition. Uh, today, most of the experts, they agree that the complexity living is a sustainable living. Uh, the cities like Portland, Oregon have successfully established a growth boundary that can curb the sprawl. So there are a few examples which one can basically look into in terms of theory and they can study those cities together in detail. And there are plenty of evidences that more compact cities with higher densities can encourage the use of public transport also and an optimum use of urban infrastructure. Uh, these are a few of the slides which I also use it as my own uh, tools to kind of define a neighborhood planning. So this is one diagram which I had picked up from a book called Shaping Neighborhoods by H. Barton. And it talks about a unit home patch. It kind of defines very scientifically in terms of how far your parks should be there or how far your market should be there, how far your healthcare should be there. So this one particular diagram is, has been evolved out of an extensive research which has been done by the author. And it comes on handy, you know, uh, today our UDPFI guidelines are also defined on a more or less on a similar line. So our urban policy makers, basically they kind of use these parameters and then they, of course, they refine it based on the context of every city. But it kind of tells you in terms of at what particular density, what particular amenity or the facility should be available and what at what distance. Some of the historic cities, Cities like Redburn and things like that are already defined in the past many, almost a decade, uh, almost a century ago. And they kind of tells you in terms of how a typical urban fabric can be designed with, a, with such kind of a format. So moving on to the idea of urban intensity. The urban intensity can be defined with the help of four major parameters, the, the density, diversity, connectedness and compactness. What it evolves, of course, is a fabric of all these mix where the typologies kind of define their own characters. The green spaces are integrated with it. There is an urban greenery which has evolved. There are a lot of amenities to us. Making neighborhoods more compact and dense, of course, needs a more careful consideration, as I mentioned earlier. And I showed you a few slides of Chicago earlier and things like that where there is obvious problems in terms of daylighting and the quality of life the moment you start growing higher. So how do you mitigate that? One of the very famous example of the policy which was done in uh, New York, uh, it was one of the building bylaws which, was, uh, which came into practice in 1916. What I famously call it as more like a wedding cake sort of a building typology. It is called the ziggurat zoning and the idea of this particular zoning was to achieve a sufficient daylight with a growing density, what happened was that in New York City, a lot of tall, high-rise skyscrapers started evolving. And obviously, it kind of made, you know, the, the life at the street level for the end user more and more derelict. So the government over there, they came up with this idea of stepping back in terms of the height of the building. So the, the more you grow taller, you need to step back and you have the ziggurat sort of a planning coming into play. This was the first attempt in terms of how the quality of life was addressed at an urban city level. Well, a good urban design can always, of course, us to ensure all these parameters and have to move forward. So, what happens when you are already densifying where the city is already dense? So, what are the ways to do that? So, let me, let me, let me, take, let me give you two examples. One example is on your left, which talks about a density which is already there. And just by simply increasing the FAR, or what I call it as a floor area ratio, if the people are not uh, from the architectural background, the floor area ratio or a floor space index, we kind of define it. It is primarily the factor of how much you can build on a piece of land. So what happens on the, on the left is one can simply increase the number of floors and increase the density where you can basically address to the growing pressures on the land passes. Or what you can also do is what I call it as a cap and trade zoning. The cap and trade zoning is primarily a zoning which can be determined at a contextual level, at a, at a granular level rather. So every particular 
neighborhood would have its own cap and trade zoning, which will kind of determine the character of the tall building, as well as it will also determine how the typologies are defined. It automatically creates or generates a lot of landmarks in the city. This can be further integrated with kind of various mixed uses, which can be amalgamated into these buildings. So one of the towers could be a business center, the other the tower could be a residential, the other tower, one tower could also be a, a, you know, a, a mall or some kind of a, a street level market or a theater, for example, which kind of brings along a lot of variety in the urban fabric. So a high quality urban design can, of course, elevate a negative perception of density at the metropolitan scale, of course. So, you know, if you have to create a city which kind of comes along with a cap and trade zoning, it kind of creates a, a beautiful imagery of the city if you look at it from a broader perspective, as well as at a granular level. The higher densities require a better housing typologies, a wider range of compact housing models, and innovative design solutions that integrates the urban greenery and the high quality of public spaces and quality of life. When I spoke about the buildings, it is important that we go down to the, some of the examples which have already been address, addressed in certain parts of the world. One very famous building which is the Central Park Sydney and the other one which is Pinnacle Duxton. And there are many more examples, so there is a linked hybrid in Beijing. Uh, there is also the interlace in Singapore which talks about or gives you an idea in terms of when you are designing even a building for example, that building can actually set an example in terms of how the overall city fabric can be very well connected. If you look at these images, one can actually notice that the social spaces are kind of addressed through this building typologies. So the architect himself is, is not only restricting himself in terms of designing the building within his particular parameter, but he is taking the cognizance of the fact that, okay, it is a building which is for the people. You know, it's, of course, uh, you know, there are certain economic viability. If I have to go to the, to the top level terrace connected on the Pinnacle Duxton, I have to pay $5. So that's obviously, that's another reason of doing that. But the, the idea of allowing the public to go to the terrace or the roof level of, the, of a public housing project in Singapore was a big step by the Singapore government in itself, I think. So, and you get a beautiful panoramic view, you get a sense of belonging, you kind of address to your city. When you start looking at your city much more closer and much more uh, at, a, at, a, at a broader level, the accountability at a citizenship level also increases. That brings along a lot of quality of life itself. So the, today, you know, the planners and architects can easily visualize and simulate the benefits of the various density. You know, there are, there are various methodologies which are there in the past, theories are available, and one can do a huge research in terms of achieving this quality. While uh, <clears throat> different cities have adopted such kind of typologies, this is one image of the Falls Creek, Vancouver, Canada. It talks about a beautiful amalgamation how, of how the urban greenery is interlaced, how the connectivity is grown at the grade level, at a subgrade level. But primarily, I think it talks about certain basic parameters. You know, it talks about a strong alignment of land use and mobility with an efficient public transit systems, a connectivity, proximity, and nearness to amenities. I spoke about those diagrams in terms of how far certain amenities are there from a home patch. To keep the city cool, of course, there is an integration of urban parks and greeneries which are done either on the roof level or at the grade level. And then, of course, uh, primarily the studies uh, defines that normally the four to eight stories projects with a mixed use vibrancy kind of brings along a right mix. Now, this, of course, is still under research. One can debate about it and reduce the loss of ventilation on it. But moving forward, I will go to the next level. Well, while we touched upon the physical and the social demographic dimensions of achieving an ideal future city, we obviously seem to have forgotten one very important aspect <clears throat> and the major phenomena which is already taking place and growing at a very rapid and unprecedented level. This enigma is a real story. And it is nowhere to be, nowhere else to be found, but probably in the pocket. I'm talking about your smartphones. My friend, Dr. Virupan explained uh, in terms of what goes into making a smartphone yesterday. <laughs> but no offense, I think the smartphone today actually runs the city in itself. It is a need of an hour, of course, but I, I take the cognizance in terms of we should be obviously be more eco-sensitive about it. So I'll, I'll talk about the cities of tomorrow. 
Well, the old city of concrete, glass and steel have now uh, conceals a vast underworld of computers and softwares. And they have been linked with a, via internet. These devices are being stitched together into a nervous system that supports the daily lives of billions of people around the world. They kind of dispatch pa packages. I can book my flights. I can pay my utility bills. I can transfer the bank accounts. I can do my business any part of the world, wherever I am. How do the cities play a role in this is very, very important. Today, when we call about smart cities and the urban design, which can be adopted to such kind of a, a revolutionary change, which has been brought in, is very important. <coughs> so the machines that now run the world for us, in most of the cases, it is no more a, a physical or a social revolution which is taking place, but it's more like an information revolution which is taking place. And that is very, very important for us to understand. So not since the laying of the water mains and the sewage pipes or the subway tracks or the telephone lines, etc., were being done physically, but now also they have been controlled by this kind of a internet linked utilities. You know, this digital upgrade to our built legacy is obviously giving rise to more and more smart cities across the world. Some of the major giants or the technical, technological giants, I would say, companies like IBM or Cisco, they have already kind of have tied up with uh, many governments across the world who kind of help the governments to kind of run their utilities in a much more optimum way. They have a huge control center where they monitor it. It's, it's like creating an ATC across the government works. It kind of checks all the utilities, it checks all the leakages, plugs it on, it can controls the flow of it, it controls the resources, as I mentioned. And obviously everything is managed. And imagine a city which is managed so well, so pretty. Well, it of course, the future is here and coming. Century of the urban, urbanization is the humanity's uh, last attempt to have our cake to eat to it. <coughs> It is actually very, very important that how you adopt to this particular growing technology. One can, now there's a very famous slide from one of my favorite movie called Iron Man, because I always felt that, uh, you know, this was one of the movie which actually showed how a smart city can be controlled at an individual level, finally. And this probably is coming very fast to us. Well, the time will judge of a certain audacious promises what we do to ourselves. But you don't have to take it sitting down because this is not an industrial revolution. As I mentioned, it is an information revolution. And you are no longer just a cog in the vast machine, but you are a part of the mind of the smart city itself and gives you that power to shape the future. That's all, gentlemen. That's all I have to say today. <laughs> Thank you for listening to me. Thank you so much.